It is exactly three o'clock, and this means that it's time to start the today's online technology meeting of single photon source and detectors. My name is Panagiotis Vergiris, and you can call me Panos. I'm the Photonics Pro uh, Technologies uh, Program Manager in EPICS, and now I would like to share my slides. Uh, we are EPIC. We are the European Photonics Industry Consortium, and we're the world leading industry association that promotes sustainable development of organizations working in the field of photonics in Europe. We now count for more than 700 members, 777 members as for today, and we keep uh, growing. The areas that EPIC is active are many variants. We organize technical workshops and roundtables. We serve and sustain a highly valuable network. We we'll help you with market intelligence with the support of Tracy Vanik, and we we'll help you raise capital. And we support HR activities with the biggest website to find the job in photonics. In this slide here, you can also see all the people behind this great effort of EPIC. And let me now pass at our uh, today's topic, uh, which will be on single photon sources and detectors. The plan of this meeting, as all the online technology meetings of EPIC, is to create new business opportunities to connect the people and to introduce one to each other. And today we are going to listen what are the existing solutions in the market of signal photon generation and detection, uh, how they can be improved, and how they can serve the needs of big end users from uh, telecommunications, defense, and space. Today's meeting is mostly uh, focused on to uh, quantum, but of course um, the uh, questions and discussion regarding technology and application in other fields are welcome. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to have a very, uh, uh, very interesting meeting and we are going to be able to create important connections and new collaborations. And now I would like to uh, thank our sponsors for this meeting. Uh, our sponsors are QTech, which represents a local ecosystem of companies creating scalable prototypes of quantum internet and quantum computing. Uh, Quandela, that provides and creates bright and big uh, tail single photon sources into systems to develop a photonic quantum computer. Uh, they will soon release a six-qubit photonic panel computer uh, on the cloud by the end of the next year, but maybe we'll listen uh, more from, from our speakers, from our speaker from Guadella today. Uh, we also have Pi Imaging Technology. Uh, they focus on providing SPAD arrays with extremely high sensitivity and low noise. They integrate their detectors with time taggers and time gate functionalities. Uh, another sponsor is Imasenic, which is an innovative fabulous semiconductor company that develops custom CMOS image sensors for single photon detections for imaging and time of flight applications. Uh, Swiss Micro Optics that manufactures high quality refractive and diffractive micro optics on 200 millimeter waivers uh, for applications in automotive, photolithography, fiber optics, silicon photonics, and more. And finally, we have also Excelitas that delivers innovative high performance solutions to meet the lighting detections and optical technology needs of original equipment manufacturers. And now here you can see an overview of all the upcoming technology meetings for the next four months. For today's audience, I would like to highlight that we are having one more meeting planned related to quantum, which will be on quantum communication and QKD systems on 27th of June, uh, 2022. Uh, other meetings that might be of interest for you, it will be uh, on hybrid photonic integrated uh, circuits or co-packaged optics for hyperscale data centers. Please remember always to visit our website and register. And we have finally start having also some physical meetings. The first physical quantum meeting in front of us will be held at Munich, the same time with later World of Photonics and World of Quantum on 26th of April. And it will be on single photon source and detectors as well. In this meeting though, we're gonna approach uh, this topic from a different uh, point of view. We're targeted to meet in person and listen to the needs of big end users from the field of telecommunication, space and defense in single photon generation and detection. And then uh, we're gonna have one more physical meeting on 7 to 8th of September. Um, uh, we're gonna have the Epic Industrial Quantum Photonics Technology Summit at Glasgow University. In this event, we will bring together the European quantum industry ecosystem to commercialize upcoming products from the current uh, research and development initiatives. We will discuss the second quantum revolution, its applications and challenges, and what role Europe is going to play in this emerging market. And now, if any of you would like to get introduced to any of the other participants of the meeting, they can always contact me afterwards in my mail, panagiotis.vergiris at epic asocom or to my colleague Ivan Nikitsky, and the email is the same format, with who I'm moderating this event today. Ivan, I hope you're already here. Uh, the ones in the room are encouraged to actively participate in the meeting and ask all the technology-related questions uh, they do have. Uh, you can, of course, put it in the chat, and we'll bring it in the room to share with all the participants. I'm sure we can have a very interesting discussion. 
Before I continue, I would like to remind you that those meetings are recorded and live streamed on YouTube. So remember that those that are following YouTube can ask questions as well, and we will bring them here in the room to be addressed. And now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Ivan Nikiski. Ivan, can you please let us know what's going to happen today? Yes, thank you, Panos. <clears throat> okay, uh, welcome everyone to our online technology meeting on the single photon sources and detectors. And uh, we have a very exciting agenda today. We have uh, um, eight speakers, and we'll start with uh, those that uh, commercialize the photon so, um, detectors. And then we'll switch to photon sources, as well as uh, applications of uh, photon sources. And at the end, we'll have a couple of talks uh, devoted to software. And um, so apart from the um, speakers today, we actually have a lot of uh, other people in the room they represent the whole value chain for quantum technologies. Um, Panos? Um, right, so, uh, so on this slide, you see actually the companies that are represented in the room uh, today. So please uh, be proactive, uh, ask questions and uh, feel free to contact each other in the chat. And uh, if you want to, if you're interested in meeting any, any of them, so please, after the meeting, contact me or Panos. So we have uh, end users that uh, work in the field of defense and telecommunication, quantum key, key distribution and banking, but uh, also the whole value chain is represented. So detection solutions, optical imaging and sensing, optical design software, uh, light coupling solutions. And of course, as we're talking about quantum technologies, there are a lot of uh, R&D entities represented. So, so I'm not gonna tease you for any longer. Please enjoy the meeting. And uh, let's go to our first speaker, Panos. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, thank you. So we can pass to our first speaker for today, which is uh, Michelle Adolovitz, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Pyimagine Technology. Thank you very much, Panos. Yes, Let sir. me share my, uh, my screen. Actually, my PPT. So please just confirm it's OK. You can see my screen. Can you see my screen? It's good. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, at Pyimaging Technology, we are creating a photon counting arrays based on single photon avalanche diodes, PADS, and we focus on very high sensitivity and low noise. So let us make one step back and discuss why we use a SPAD arrays in general. I think they have exceptionally high readability of low light signals, quantified in a very high signal to noise ratio. And the second property, which is very important, is that they have extremely precise timing quantified in a very low standard deviation of the timing jitter. Uh, here on the bottom, you can see, uh, the, for example, a system measurement of our, of, of our SPAD combined with a time tagger, uh, which is around 100 picoseconds, but the device itself is uh, typically in the order of uh, 10 picoseconds. We encounter low light uh, in quantum applications, of course, when we typically want to uh, know if there is a photon or no photon. Uh, we have low light scenarios also in single particle uh, detection, single molecule anal analysis. Um, and, and then we, we operate in this regime where we have uh, zero to, uh, to two photons uh, potentially. Um, and you can see the difference in the, in the SNR of a, of a SPAD and a typical photodiode, which is operated at a very high speed. Um, low light is typically coupled with high speed. Uh, if you do image um, uh, over, uh, or when we scan over a field of view, we want to do that as fast as possible. Or if you want to analyze some movements, we want to oversample in time. And this is um, leading to a situation where, where we have really a small um, intensity uh, detected at the, um, at the, at the uh, imaging plane. So, in this uh, high speed field, we are typically operating uh, between one and 100 uh, impinging photons. And then you can focus your attention to these uh, images on the, on the bottom right, where you see an example of a photodiode operated at a very high speed or a, um, a CMOS image sensor operated at a very high speed at 80% sensitivity and um, a, a readout noise of, of 10 electrons 
compared to a SPAD, which has only 50% sensitivity, but readout, uh, zero readout noise. And you can appreciate really the, the big difference uh, in the image quality of those two. And that's where we want to focus our, um, our, our SPAD, uh, SPAD arrays too. Um, the last uh, application field is, of course, coupled with the, with the timing precision. We uh, want to estimate either a Gaussian distribution, time distribution, or exponential uh, time distribution Gaussian in LiDAR, for example, when we get just the, um, the, the light reflected from objects. Uh, in uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging, we want to estimate the, uh, the parameters of uh, exponential distribution. And then we couple the, uh, the detector with pulsed uh, light sources. So now on my uh, following slide, I, I will show you a few uh, application examples of SPAD arrays and image sensors. Uh, so here on this slide, you can see uh, scanning microscopy uh, as an application. And SPAD arrays particularly enable you to increase the resolution by a factor of 1. 0.7 to uh, 4, all the way 4 for extensions of this uh, um, image scanning microscopy, uh, for example, quantum uh, image scanning microscopy or SOFI image scanning microscopy. On the bottom side, uh, you can see um, uh, the, uh, the demonstration of the uh, improvement in the resolution uh, as a decrease in the point spread function size, which comes then naturally also with the increased intensity. Because we have uh, uh, this uh, fine timing resolution, we can, of course, then couple um, our detector with uh, time taggers and, and use, uh, use them to analyze uh, fluorescence lifetime. Um, in the context of SPAD arrays, it's very uh, interesting to understand that we can reduce the pileup effect because we have pixel parallelization and then we can increase the imaging speed. So here on the bottom, you can see a, a typical um, exponential distribution measured with our detector. Um, and now going to uh, SPAD image sensors, so full uh, field uh, uh, arrays. Um, I wanted to show you a few examples, uh, focusing on the fact that we, because we have zero readout noise, we can operate our cameras at a very high frame rate of more than uh, uh, of, of uh, 100 kiloframes per second. So here on the, on the left-hand side, you can see, for example, a fan rotating that initially looks blurred because you're just too slow. And then once you increase the speed, you can, of course, uh, capture the, the fan uh, movement. The same goes, for example, for, uh, for a lighter. Firstly, at 300 frames per second, then you switch to 2,000 frames per second. You can see a beautiful uh, firework here. And then finally, if you, if you switch to uh, well, almost the, the highest frame rate, uh, you, you of course get less light, but uh, you can still uh, see a lot of uh, very fine movements of this uh, firework. And then maybe what's, what's uh, the most important and coolest part is uh, shown here on the bottom, where you can, you can see uh, that we can capture light in flight with this uh, SPAD image sensor. So you can see here the laser propagating uh, over space and uh, hitting the mirrors reflecting. We do our arrays in um, uh, conventional semiconductor flows, so CMOS. Uh, this enables us to have a different pixel resolution from 23 to all the way to a quarter, a quarter of a megapixel and more. Uh, the peak uh, detection probability uh, is over 50%. Uh, we do not lose um, because of uh, field factor, because we have microns and enhanced field factor. Our dark count rate is uh, low, uh, it's below 100 counts per second, depending on the, on the pixel size. And what I mentioned before, to utilize this uh, fine um, or, or good timing precision, we are using time taggers with 20 picosecond resolution, or for big image sensors, we are using time gating, which is, um, in short, exposing the sensor for a very short period of time, typically 10 nanoseconds. Time tagging allows you to get the time of arrival and pixel address of each photon. And time tagging is enabling you to uh, reject photons outside of your exposure window. Uh, and the way how we then rec reconstruct uh, a timing distribution is that you have a shifted uh, gate. 
between the frames. Here, the particularity of a SPAD image sensor is that it's much more precise than, for example, the, the two, uh, two tap or four tap um, conventional CMOS sensors. I want to show you our products. SPAD 23 is our uh, smallest array, uh, only 23 pixels. So here on the right hand side, you can see the beautiful uh, micrograph. It's very small, compact, credit card sized, integrating also uh, the tagging functionality. Uh, we have a software which enables photon counting and time tagging. And then looking here at the big image sensor, you can see in the middle the uh, PCB holding the, the beautiful chip and then the micrograph on the right hand side. As well, here we have, we have software um, operated for photon counting in different frame rates, uh, time gating, and um, functionality for, uh, for FLIM. So with that, I would like to uh, summarize uh, with the motto of EPIC. Of course, we are offering SPAD arrays, and we look for system integrators of SPAD arrays. And we are also hiring, so check out our LinkedIn page. That would be it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Michel. Thank you. Thank you for presenting these amazing products here. I'm sure that uh, uh, can give uh, really nice solutions, especially when it comes to photo counted for quadum experiments. But it seems that we have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, one comes from uh, Alessandro Rosetta from Flim Labs. Alessandro, would you mind uh, have the question yourself? Thank you, Vanos. Hi, Michel. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So first of all, you mentioned the pile-up uh, pile effect, and have you characterized uh, the, how the pile-up effect affects uh, the estimation of fluorescence lifetime? Can you compensate that for that? Uh, you can compensate for the, as you probably know, you can compensate for the pile-up effect at, at the reduction of the SNR. Uh, so if you have pixel parallelization, then you don't need to compensate if you distribute light uniformly over the array. Um, and then uh, the signal-to-noise ratio stays at a high quality. Okay. Um, I have also another question, which is, uh, can you be a little bit, uh, let's say, more specific about the time tagging abilities? Mm -hmm. uh, like, can you give the user, let's say, a single photon information, let's say, uh, photon tag, uh, photon per photon, or let's say you stream via the USB some kind of uh, already... Uh, the elaborated information. Um, no, it's it's a uh, it's the raw data which contains basically the uh, the time, uh, the uh, very precise time, and then also uh, uh, time in ten nanoseconds. So okay. we have a, a part with uh, twenty picoseconds, ten nanoseconds, and then we have the address of the pixel. Okay, and. Um... I don't know, um, since you also mentioned uh, this difference between time gating and phase gating, mm -hmm. uh, time tagging and time gating, I don't know if you ever consider on doing something, let's say more to do not have uh, to use photons when doing uh, the phase gating. I don't know if you're working on it or... Um, the, the motivation for time gating comes from the um, pixel resolution and the complexity that time taking imposes uh, mm -hmm. on the data stream uh, when you have uh, a big array. Um, no, no, I, I, I am familiar with the technology, but I, uh, I was wondering if you, have, if you are working on, let's say some kind of tricks uh, so that uh, when you're doing uh, phase gating, you don't have to lose uh, some photons due to the fact that you don't have a 100%, 100% duty cycle when sampling up the photo. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, what can be done as well is that uh, you have uh, two gates which are covering the full period of the, of the laser. Uh, then this would be equivalent to, to capturing all the photons. And that's, yeah, we can discuss that. Yes, that's possible. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Sorry for all the questions, but uh, thank you. It's, it's very in line to what I'm doing, what I did in the past. So thank you. No, thank you, Alessandro, for the questions. <laughs> and uh, Michelle, I'm sorry, but there are more things that are coming here, and this is great. Yes. Uh, we have one more question uh, uh, from uh, Imasenik, Renato Turqueta. Renato? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk, Michael. Um, yeah, my question is, um, I mean, SPA technology is great for doing time of flight, detecting the arrival time, 
uh, of single photons precisely, but uh, you mentioned high speed imaging. I, I think in that field, the application for SPAD is quite limited because, uh, and if you look at very high speed cameras uh, and you translate into SPAD performance, you should have a dead time of uh, much less than one nanosecond. So maybe you want to comment on this? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, what we claim is that high speed is typically coupled with low light. You get less light because you're operating high speed. Um, so I would argue that in most of the applications, it's going to be more than enough, the dynamic range that you have with the SPADs. Of course, if you have really a lot of light and then you want to operate uh, in high speed, and then you don't care so much about the readout noise. Then I would say, please feel free and go ahead with the, with the normal image sensors. But I argue that this is not typically the case. And, and just a comment in, in addition to that, uh, there is nothing fundamental to, to stop uh, the SPAD to integrate multi-bit counters on chip as well. Uh, and then this, um, yeah, I, I think that this is a, a comment that, that has no ground. Well, I think, I mean, sorry, I think, I think existing detector, you still have a, even compare, even considering the noise performance of SPAD, of course it's single photon or well, yeah. single electron detection because uh, yep. not all the photons are detected, but uh, even with this, you still look at a very, very small dead time, which I think it's really almost uh, physically impossible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th that's a very interesting discussion. I would yeah, love to go ahead. Uh, but in general, you know, the, the that time is, um, is not an issue because it's, if it's short enough, um, you can extrapolate back. It's just uh, the curve that you need to um, correct for. Um, of course, you at some point, if you get too much photons, then it's, but getting more than one photon per 10 nanoseconds, it's extremely high dynamic range. Uh, that's, can you, can you mention an example where, where uh, this is the case? Well, there are, uh, there are cameras, if you look at the uh, ultra fast, what are called ultra fast imaging. So cameras that go at uh, more than 1 million frames per second. Uh, they that's have, burst, uh, burst, burst mode, right? That's, they can maybe capture 30 frames. Yeah, burst mode, yeah. But it, I mean, many application is, that's good enough, but they, they do need, uh, light to get uh, the dynamic range. So uh, that's where even with the, with the higher noise they have, uh, the, the signal to noise ratio is higher that you could achieve with a SPAD with a reasonable dead time uh, as well, with a, a state of art that time actually. So yeah, that's that, why I was yeah. interested in, uh, I mean, maybe there are application you're thinking of where you can uh, use uh, your technology, but. That's why I was interested in too. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. I think that maybe we can discuss later and, and see, but um, I would say for even for photography, you will not run into problems because there's just not that much light. It's the, the, the rate is not uh, 100 mega counts per second. It's much smaller. It's around one mega count per second max. That's, okay. That's my, Okay, Michelle, thanks a lot. I'm sorry for interrupting this discussion, but there are more questions. We can, as I Thank said, you. at the end of the, after after this, uh, uh, the full meeting, we're going to stay more and we can further discuss or we can have an introduction afterwards. Uh, there are more questions. So one more question comes from uh, Quantopticon. It's Mirella Koleva. Uh, Mirella, would you like to ask a question yourself? Yeah, so I was just um, generally wondering. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I was just wondering how your SPAD array compares to that of a company called Photon Force. Mm -hmm. So Photon Force, they have a, a slightly bigger uh, sensor than our SPAD 23. So they have uh, 32 by 32 pixels and they have these time takers integrated in the pixel itself. Um, they do not publish sensitivity and noise data, but I think we have a strong advantage there but they do not publish it. So that I, I cannot tell uh, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks Mirella for the question. Thanks myself for the answer. 
One more question comes from Francis, and I think uh, this one should be the last one for today. So, uh, Bozida. Uh, th thank you, Michelle. I just, I hope I didn't miss this, uh, but uh, my question is related to the crosstalk. So mm -hmm. the, uh, from due, due to secondary photons in, uh, generated by avalanche, do you see a lot of problems with that? And how do you, do you need to post-process that out, filter it out in, in software in some way? Uh, no, our crosstalk and after pulse, pulse, pulsing is one per mil. This is due to the long development that we did on the, on the SPAD. So it's extremely good. Any, any way you can explain how you achieve that? Is it a, a secret or? <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot go into the details. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you, Michel. Uh, but then you, want, you have also something to show us today, correct? Yes. Can you please share it? Maybe it's a good moment. Thank Thanks you. a lot, yes. Michel. Thank you. We cannot see anything yet. Uh, there you are. Yeah, I apologize. I think uh, my, my laptop is having some issues. Just a second. So I propose uh, that I come back to you later so we can go to the next speaker if you and try to solve those issues in the in the meantime. OK, okay. Uh, but that, thanks a lot I, because we're really tight. If you solve it, we're here. Yeah, I think I have some issues. I will have to come back. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Bazidar. And I'm sorry for, but I have to go to the next speaker now. Um, so the next speaker comes from uh, Sigul Fandom, and it's Jesse Queen Drakeli, uh, the CEO of Sigul Fandom. Jesse, are you ready to start your slides? Yes. All right. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see everything. Perfect. That's very good. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what we do at Single Quantum. Uh, so before I start, I would like to ask you two questions. Uh, first, so what are actually single photon detectors? So if you think about it, they are they are pretty much light sensors. So they are sensitive to light, just like cameras and uh, human eyes. But what's different about single photon detectors is that um, um, you can see the single photon, which carries very small of, amount of energy. So the challenge is ultimately, how do you convert this very small amount of energy into a electric signal that is strong enough so you can capture and uh, process it? Okay, so, um, well, what we do is uh, uh, single photon detectors based on superconducting nanowire. Um, so what's special about it? Um, I think, again, if you think about a single photon, um, the energy it carries depends on its wavelength. So uh, that said, if you have UV lights or visible lights, the photon energy is relatively high. But if you move to near infrared or mid infrared, it becomes even more difficult to see a single photon. So that's where superconducting nanowire single photon detectors or SNSPD uh, can make a difference. And uh, in addition, um, uh, let's say, um, Michelle already mentioned it. So photons actually, there is a lot of uh, mm, timing information encoded in photons that we are interested in. So how can you extract that uh, timing information? What if you care about processes that uh, um, that is on a time scale of uh, less than 100 picosecond, on the order of 10 picosecond. So with SNSPD, you can possibly see, let's say, telecom wavelengths, photons with a uh, high detecting efficiency of uh, 85 to 90 percent. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, to detect photons on a time scale, distinguish them at a, on a time scale of uh, 10 picosecond, which is 100 billionth of a second, which is pretty crazy. So. Um, so with that, you, you can enable a lot of very interesting applications. And here I shortlisted three of them, uh, which we are very enthusiastic about. Uh, first, of, well, first of them is quantum secured communication. Um, I'm guessing a lot of, uh, mm, a lot of uh, people in this uh, meeting room is also working on um, applications such as quantum key distributions. Uh, so with SNSFPDs, you can, um, establish 
communication link over a long distance of several hundred kilometers, eventually enabling um, building a quantum communication network across uh, a continent and uh, uh, while at the same time maintaining a very low quantum error, uh, quantum bit error rate. And uh, space technology, uh, things such as um, space debris tracking or deep space communication. Um, with SMSPD, you can possibly do um, enable, let's say, missions in space as far as Mars or Jupiter. Uh, and uh, neural science. So we have also shown that with SMSPD, you can do imaging into, uh, for example, brain tissues. You can penetrate deeper into the brain and help us to understand neural activities uh, or how our immunity system works um, and um, or possibly diagnose diseases. All right, so um, yeah, to enable all these applications, a single quantum, we make it our mission to make the world's fastest and most sensitive light sensors limited only by the laws of physics. So our flagship product is called Single Quantum EOS. It's a superconducting nanowire single photon detection system. Um, it's based on a um, tabletop closed close cycle uh, cryostat, which, is, which you see uh, in the very middle of this picture. Uh, it is less than 60 centimeter tall. Uh, that's the standard version. And uh, it can host multiple superconducting nanowires on its cold finger. So um, yeah, what can it do? Um, well, first, um, don't be scared away by using cryogenics. Uh, it has a helium-free continuous operation of more than 10,000 hours without any downtime. Um, it gives you high um, photon detection efficiency, uh, especially remarkable if you work at uh, near infrared or moving toward mid infrared. Mm, it has a very good uh, time resolution, low timing jitter. Uh, we offer as low as less than 15 picosecond. Mm, and um, the system is designed to be uh, very easy to use, plug and play, um, powered by robust fiber coupling, as well as a, um, yeah, a very friendly user interface. We also have a dedicated service team offering technical service. And by far, we have sold more than 170 systems all over the world. Um, so yeah, with that, I would like to ask you if you have any ideas, uh, in, innovative ideas, how you can use SNSPDs to uh, implement something interesting, please reach out to us. We are open for collaboration. Or uh, if you see SNSPD can possibly enhance the, the product uh, you're making or the experiment you're doing, uh, please contact us. Um, and last but not least, if you know someone who is looking for a career opportunity to work at the frontier of quantum tech and want to make a difference, please contact us. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jesse. This was very informative. So there are already several questions for you. So maybe Thierry from uh, Tematis, could you go ahead? Uh, yes, thank you, Jesse. Uh, just a, a quick question for you on the first uh, um, presenter. It's uh, how the, the your technology as an SPD compares with the SPADs. It's single photon detectors and there are also single photon detectors. So I will, what is the comparison between the two, please? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think that um, it really depends on the applications. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are applications where SPOT is um, more superior, um, but I think for SNSPD, first, if the photon energy is lower, if you're working at longer wavelengths, I believe SNSPD is, uh, has a clear advantage. And on top of that, uh, I think that the uh, Oh, well, let's say maybe I also want to talk about what's good about uh, SPOT. I think it's relatively easier to make um, a larger detection area. So with SNSPD, uh, it's uh, because it's based on uh, thin film nanofabrication. So it's more challenging to make a very large area. So for example, uh, what Pi imaging has showed to capture image on, on a camera-like device, that's going to be very challenging. But I, I don't know if it's, maybe it's going to be possible in the future. Um, but 
Uh, that said, we also make multi-pixel devices, uh, but perhaps the number of pixels uh, is going to be very difficult to make many, many pixels. Okay, thank you, uh, Jesse. Uh, Matthew from INO, do we have a question at all? Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I wasn't mute. Yeah, uh, very interesting. And uh, I wonder, you you were talking about uh, AVM free technology. Um, so somehow you are mechanically cryo cooled, right? And you you talk about uh, space technologies. Uh, is it something what you hope one day to send into space? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Yes, um, I think that the, yes. We are very ambitious. We want to do that to send SPDs into the space. But that said, I don't think it's going to be happening very soon. So in the near future, uh, the direct applications we see will be SNSPDs installed in ground stations. For okay. example, where you establish a space communication link. Like, you, you know, putting that into a bell state analyzer on ground and uh, let's say using uh, an integrated source on board satellites and uh, making QKD or even quantum teleportation or something like that. For example, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. And now uh, Pinhas from uh, Quantiler. Would you like to ask a question? Sorry about that. Um, I, I was curious in terms of the comparison with SPADs uh, you mentioned in terms of size that they're more suited to small size, what order of magnitude are you talking? I was also wondering in terms of cost, how it compares again in terms of order of magnitude. So are you talking about the detection area? Am I understanding? Yes, that? yes I am. Um, yeah, actually I'm not so sure about the state of the art of uh, let's say how big you can make SPAD. Uh, but I think in terms of SNSPD, uh, I can safely say that uh, we have already developed SNSPDs that can be coupled to multi-mode fiber with a, a core diameter of 50 micron. Um, but I believe SPOT can do much bigger. Okay, so you're saying something of 20 or 30 microns to couple with a single mode fiber would not be a problem. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, and... and... Uh -huh. In terms of cost, how do they compare? Uh... That's also a good question, yeah. I think at the, those wavelengths where silicon uh, APDs can be used, um, SNSPD is going to be very difficult for SNSPDs to compete on the price. But again, if you move to longer wavelengths and you need to use ingas APDs, you need nitrogen cooling, then actually, uh, let's say, if you want to make devices with similar performance, or let's say if you use SNSPD, it's just a maybe you know five or ten times better performance signal noise ratio. Um, and if you need let's say three or four of them uh, for your experiment, then SNSPD is actually already more cost efficient. Wonderful, thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, Jesse. I think we'll have to go to the next or next speaker uh, today. So that's uh, Cecile from uh, uh, Sparrow Quantum. Yeah, thank you. Let's see if I can share my screen as well. And like this, perhaps. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, it still looks good to you. Um, more or less. Good. OK. Um, well, first of all, then thank you to Epic for hosting this webinar. It's been super interesting so far. And thank you for inviting Sparrow as one of the speakers. My name is Cecilia, and I, in the next couple of minutes, I'll just explain to you what we do at Sparrow Quantum. Um, at Sparrow, we develop and manufacture single photon sources, and our technology is based on quantum dots in gallium arsenide wafers. We then do nano fabrication on these wafers and create these structures that allows us to control the emission from the quantum dots. Um, and the photo you see here in the back is one of our chips. It has a size of around three by three millimeters. Um, and if we zoom into one of these chips, then you will see one of our standard structures here. Um, this one we call the single-sided photonic crystal waveguide. And it's actually an animation, so you can see kind of how it works, um, if it wants, yeah. So you send in pulsed laser, 
onto the photonic crystal part. And then we have this uh, gated control across it. You excite the quantum dot, which then emits a photon that's guided along the waveguide and out of the plane through these grading covers. Yeah. And I just quickly want to elaborate on a few of the most important features here. So first of all, our source is a state-of-the-art single photon source. Um, and we do this by creating and being very cautious of our environment around the quantum dot. So we create a low noise environment by having these gold contact pads around it. So we can control the um, voltage bias across our quantum dot very um, and define it very well. Another key feature is our ability to do resonant excitation, um, which again makes for very high performance. And this is possible because of our in-plane design. So as you saw, we were able to, we have this spatial separation between our laser input and our output emission. Um, and this separation actually also allows us to collect all of the photons from the chip without doing any polarization filtering afterwards. So this means that we have, uh, we have no fundamental limit to how well we can collect the photons that we have uh, inside of our chip, uh, which makes for this on-chip deterministic single photon source. Yeah. And then here, I'm just quickly flashing what the setup around the chip would look like, because you have the chip, and then you do require to operate it inside a cryogenic uh, a cryostat of around 4 Kelvin, or 4 to 10 Kelvin, really. And then, of course, you have some free space optics around it. Yeah. yeah. OK, so now we have looked a little at the technology itself. Uh, and I mentioned that we do consider our source to be state of the art. So what does that actually mean? In terms of specs, when we talk about single photons, it comes down to three uh, key figures of merit, purity, indistinguishability, and efficiency. Yeah. And as I'm the first speaker for this single photon sources, then maybe I'll just run through them. So purity is the measure of what is the probability that the emission you have actually consists of single photons compared to, say, multi-photon or whatever laser background you have? Um, and indistinguishability is a measure for how much alike are your photons. So how much alike is photon number one to its neighboring photons and photon number one to like photon number 100, which is really tells you something about the quantumness and can be super important for applications. And then, of course, uh, the efficiency itself where we have this deterministic on-chip efficiency because our quantum dot, yeah, it's really the B factor that I show here of 98%, because it's so well coupled to the structure itself that we are working with. Then, of course, <laughs> another measure that customers are usually very interested in is the ease of use. Um, and for our source, it's not as easy to use as, for example, an attenuated laser but it also serves for two very different types of applications in the end. Um, so as I showed before, then our single photon source, you do require cryostat and some free space optics to operate it. Um, yeah. And I do want to make a point here actually that not all of these specs are usually equally important to all types of customers. So it really depends on what type of application they wish to do. So for some more like, Demanding protocols in the future, you might require super high indistinguishability and efficiency if you want to do multi photon experiments or simulation or so on. And for other um, applications like a standard BB84, you wouldn't bother with this. So it really comes down to understanding the customer applications to understand what type of, of spec is important um, for the single photons. Which kind of brings me to this slide. Um, so we are involved in a few different projects and looking into those application that really has the highest potential to show um, to really show the potential of our of our single photon source. So what we're looking into is telecom single photons because right now, as I showed you, the, our photons are around 950 nanometers. Then we're also looking at uh, these hybrid materials or heterogeneous uh, integrations because we are gallium arsenide, so what if we could move to silicon? Because we are deterministic on gallium isonides, so of course, it's interesting to see 
how we can build out this platform, our new data structures. Device independent QKD as well uh, is super interesting. And then perhaps the two most obvious uh, types of application for us is multiplexing and multiphoson experiments, because our chip provides a stream of single photons. And because photon number one and photon number 100 are indistinguishable with more than 95%, and that's without any correction, then you could use some fibers and switches and then turn it into, uh, I mean, basically demultiplex it and turn it into an array of single photons that can then be used, for example, for interference experiments or quantum simulation and these things. Um, yeah. And then a quick overview of our development plan. So right now, uh, our product is the one that I presented for you here, uh, this free space single photon source. And we are very confident in what we have achieved on this chip. Um, so the next step for us is really to look into making a more user-friendly product by providing a fiber couple solution. And this is something that we are developing right now. And we're actually really happy with how it's going so far. So the plan is to release our first plug and play product in spring 2023. Yeah. So to round off, and in the spirit of Epic, we have this question of what can you do for them and what can they do for you? And hopefully by now you know a little more about Sparrow and our product and what we stand for. And yeah, we're super proud of our single filter source. We really put the technology and these near unity specs first. Um, and we really believe that this is what is needed to push next generation quantum application forward. So if you have any questions um, or if you're interested in hearing more, doing collaborations with us, then please reach out. We, um, you can follow us on LinkedIn for future updates and uh, just to stay in touch. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Cecile. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting uh, uh, presentation. I like, I love the fact that you have it in the last slide. Uh, what uh, we can do with others and what others can do for you. But uh, I would have a lot of questions, but I would like to give the step to, to, the, to the audience. I have a question that comes from Juan Lorendo. Uh, Juan, you can ask the question yourself, please. Of course. Uh, hi, Cecil. Thank you for hi. the very nice talk. So I do have a couple of quick questions, actually. The first one is maybe some more details on the efficiency that you source has, like the five, the efficiency in a fiber already after all filtering and everything you needed to prepare to, that light with the quality that you mentioned, the 99% pure and then 98% indistinguishability. What sort of count rates do you expect with a 100% efficient detector, for example? That would be my first question, maybe. Yeah. yeah I'll, Let's I'll take that one first, maybe. <laughs> yes, thank you so all right. much. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so I think the great thing about our technology is, as I showed you, we have this deterministic, so we have all the single photons on our chip itself. Um, and then, of course, it comes into how well can the customer actually control when they outcouple the single photons. So how well are they able to overlap the um, mode match what we have from the grading into their system? Um, so I can tell you that in our lab, we get like easily on a daily basis, tens of megahertz um, using a normal TISAF. 80 megahertz, tens of megahertz mm -hmm. in a fiber. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but it really depends. Again, we are also working with some super good systems, right? And and yeah. are really up to it. But so in principle, really, the same could be duplicated by your customers, and they should expect. In principle, tens. okay. Yeah, and it's, it really comes down to also, again, what their customer is looking for, because perhaps they're actually not looking for having a super high efficiency. But perhaps they really value indistinguishability, and then I mean, it really depends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my second quick question would be, um, if you had a customer that placed an order today, would you be able to deliver in what time? Are you ready to deliver in six months or something like this? Or what is the yeah. situation? Yeah, so I'm not really our salesperson, uh, but if I remember correctly, then it's a six month delivery time. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, but again, that kind of depends. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm saying this a lot. Uh, because what I showed you here is our standard single filter and source structure also. So it depends when we start talking to the customer because maybe they are very, maybe they really want a specific wavelength, for example, and they really need this wavelength of 960 nanometers. Um, 
And then of course we'll have to do a little bit of juggling and we can definitely make that happen, but it depends. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Juan. You can send us an email we'll connect you with uh, Cecilia. Uh, later on, I see there is a big discussion uh, going on in the chat about the, the space and there are questions coming there, but I would like to uh, to stick, uh, it would be great to bring this discussion in the, in the screen, but I would like to skip in the, to stick in the, the, in the, in the talks. Um, and speaking about wavelengths, I would like first to go to the question that comes from uh, uh, Michel Adolonovic, we heard him before from Pi Imaging Technology. Uh, Michel, can you do the question yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Um, how difficult is it to change the wavelength? Um, just before that, it's it's amazing to to see the development. It's yeah, super great. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the technology with, that we are working with, our quantum does are randomly spaced. Mm -hmm. uh, but so usually on the wafer that we work with, we have this we have quantum dots from like nine twenty to nine eighty. Um, and then when we send a chip to a customer, then we will have, have characterized it for that type of wavelength that they're looking at. So it's actually not difficult for us to change. Yeah. That is okay. one of the easier ways to... Uh, OK. But even going, let's say, to 700 or 600, then, of course, you need to change the quantum then dot. Then, of course, exactly. Then we need to either change the quantum dot or for telecom do either some type of conversion or work with the actual structures inside of the semiconducting material. Mm -hmm. So that's another. Okay. That's research. Yes. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Michelle, for the question. That's still from the answer, uh, and I would like to go to the next question now. Uh, this one comes from uh, Mathieu Messoneva. Uh, uh, I think it's better you ask the question yourself. Yeah, Mathieu? thank you for yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, I, I got two questions. Um, uh, so. If I understand well, right now, your chip uh, does need to work at cryogenic temperature. Uh, is there a way or do you have plans uh, of you know, bringing uh, to maybe not, not really a room temperature, but maybe something which is more uh, compatible with uh, a peltier coding system? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we are working with now is this like for around these four Kelvin, even like 10 Kelvin, our system still works very well. But I think... Uh, that for Sparrow, we are very, we really like a technology first company. So we value this very high purity, very high indistinguishability. And you cannot get that at room temperature if you go like to. Uh, or even 50K to, or 60K, 60K maybe. You do. I mean, it's possible. And that's also something that we actually talk with some customers about, like if they have a cryostat that can do this then how much will their indistinguishability fall? Because you would see a little bit, you would lose some of your quantumness in the system. Like okay. We, but uh, yeah. But 10K, it's feasible. That is, yeah, that is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I, I got another question um, because as I know, we, we look at that and um, can, can we somehow integrate your, your chip with other chips, you know, maybe by using optical interposer or maybe, you know, uh, by 3D printing waveguides. Uh, mm -hmm. do, uh, do you have any customer who asks you that or maybe or do you know any customer that does that with your chip? Right? Yeah, it is something we don't know of anyone that's using our chip for that, but we are part of a project that is looking into like hybrid materials and how to do the actually some transfer printing. Yeah of okay. our sources to other chips. So it's definitely interesting also because that's really at least what I see as the future for this type of, of technology to keep working on the chip uh, and add more features. So yeah, definitely is, interesting. Okay, that is really interesting. Maybe we, mm -hmm. we need to, to contact each other because yeah. we have some ideas that I know uh, surrounding that. So definitely we need to contact them. Yeah, okay. cool. <laughs> That's perfect, but yeah, we can always uh, introduce you to that. Uh, we can Thank also, you. of course, uh, do the introduction yourself through chat. Huh? Um, and uh, I would like to go to the next question now that comes from Clean Labs, Alessandro Rosetta. Alessandro? I'm here. I still, I have a question that maybe I lost uh, this topic uh, along the way, but from, uh, let's say, an electronic point of view, what is the interface that you are providing with the chip? And have you already characterized the timing performances of the readouts from the chip? 
Okay, sorry, I didn't, not sure I heard it perfectly well, but I think what you were asking was if there's any interface. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, if, if you want, I can repeat the question. So yeah. from an electronic point of view, what is the interface of your chip? So how do you connect the chip with some kind of processing electronics? Yes. Okay, great question. Um, so yeah, as I showed you, you need to, to have to be able to control this noise environment inside a semiconducting material. You need, you need to somehow connect to these contact pads that we have on our chip. And to do this, what we're using is just like a normal, I think it's a basal voltage source actually, um, that we have outside of the cryostat. And then the cryostats that we're working with, we have customized wire solutions. So we like, it's, you just have the chip on a PCB and then connect the PCB to the wiring and then the rest does the job. So it's but, DC voltage. Okay, okay, thank you. But uh, for the single readouts of the single potents, uh, uh, if I understood correctly, have you characterized what is the jitter timing or maybe you cannot do that with a chip? Um, so we don't usually look at the jitter. I'm not really sure what you're asking, but we do make like a characterization report of, for example, what is the pulse width of the photon and what is the bandwidth and yeah. Okay, okay. No, maybe I lost uh, some this information like during the presentation because I was Googling uh, your company. Okay. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have more questions coming. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Cecil to be really quick in answering them. One comes from uh, uh, Ansis uh, Bozida uh, Novakovic. Bozida, can you do the question yourself, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah, I just have a quick question about uh, the optical interface. You mentioned that in the future you want to couple to a fiber copper. Do you see any problems with external feedback and how it affects the, the, the source? Uh, so far, we haven't. Uh, so we are developing this already, and so far we haven't seen any problem with like, uh, yeah, with our photon, single photons and going back or anything. So hopefully we won't encounter anything. But so far not. Thank you. Thank you. And there is one more question from Mirella Coleva from Quantopticon. Mirella. Hi Cecilia. Um, Hi. great talk. Um, I just had, yeah, I have, a, I have a quick question as well. I was wondering what your fabrication yield is like. Um, do you have to produce a lot of devices? Um, like, do, do, do you have a problem with, uh, um, you know, having one, one device work out of 100? Do you have to discard some, some devices when you're actually checking the quality? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Actually, I think we are, as Lisa at least as I understand, super lucky in this regard, uh, because we're spin off from the Niels Bohr Institute. So we are based on so much knowledge of doing these type of, uh, of nanostructures. So we do usually make a chip with a lot of, or we label, make a chip with a lot of structures, but like all of them works. So our yield is really great. Uh, and then it of course depends on what the customer wants and finding the right structure for them. Yeah. But yield is not an issue for us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It seems that we don't have another question. That's good because we would like to go to the next speaker. Uh, thanks a lot, Cecil, for the uh, very interesting talk. And our next speaker is Maxim Sik, the CEO of and co-founder from uh, Isaac in UK. Maxim, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, good to see everybody. Um, just give me uh, a second to share my slides. Right, so I'm um, going to talk today a little bit about uh, single photon sources. That uh, is one of the things we do at EJEC. And I think uh, the approach we generally take to developing things, and uh, in particular single photon sources, is that uh, you know, it should be simple. So quantum is already uh, you know, complicated enough. So you know, let's make it simple. And to start, you know, to introduce this, um, uh, there we go. Yes. So here's the, I'd like to show us everybody uh, and our pre-production uh, single photon source uh, chip that we're, we're getting ready to release later this year. Um, and, you know, to make it really simple, it's, uh, it's all fiber coupled. 
uh, it's all it's got all part of the uh, kind of uh, on chip uh, control and this this is our proprietary technology to control and and maintain the chip. It's uh, it's got a set of materials we make it of, so it's similar to what Sparrow does in terms of the starting point. It's uh, as well it's uh, quantum dots, uh, but in, in in a range of materials, and it's generally very um, uh, you know undemanding into the environment where it sits. So uh, you still need to cool it down. So it still needs to sit in some sort of you know cryogenic environment. But generally speaking, it could be pretty much anything. As long as it does the uh, the cooling thing, uh, you're good to go. Um, so uh, with that, it makes it super easy. You know, just buy a chip, you put it in a cryostat, and uh, there you go. Um, uh, nothing else needed. Uh, so there's uh, there's another element uh, which we found is was really important. I think for people to um, to really enjoy the benefits of single photon uh, sources and the ability, and that's different wavelengths. So um, we can make uh, quite a range of different uh, wavelengths in single photon sources. And so these are all uh, just true single photon sources. So there's no uh, fancy stuff like wavelength conversion or, or that, that sort of thing. So we do pretty much, we can do pretty much anything from red all the way into the infrared, including the C-band, the O-band for telecom wavelengths. And so that works uh, same way. I mean, it's deterministic. Uh, it's it's super fast. And uh, you know, if you want to do any research in telecom or silicon type of uh, uh, systems, um, this is uh, you know where we can really help you. Uh, you know, do, do something really really awesome. Or microscopy, for example. I mean, that that also works for some uh, for some dyes or things like that. So. I mean, we can do other wavelengths, but uh, in particular, we're wondering if anybody's interested in something like 780 to 860. Um, so if it, that's something of interest, do let us know because we're considering um, uh, working on it, uh, but we haven't locked that uh, thing yet. So we're currently collecting pre-orders for like 910, 960 range and uh, getting ready uh, our telecom wavelengths at uh, C-band, O-band for release next year. And so to like, and the system itself as well, we thought that, uh, you know, you got this chip, uh, you put it in, in a cryostat, we can supply with the cryostat. It's, uh, it's a pretty um, simple system. Uh, could be closed cycle, could be uh, wet cryogenics, or if you have something in your lab, it's fine. Uh, I'll just uh, do a little adapter uh, to do that. Um, it goes with the control electronics and uh, you also need to drive it with a laser. But again, uh, we, really relaxed about what sort of laser you have, uh, whatever is in your lab, just, just, just you can use it or we can uh, help you pick the right one. So it depends really on, on the wavelengths that, um, you know, that you would like to use for, uh, for your experiments. So it's all uh, so resonant excitation. You've got fiber in, fiber out, and a little bit of electrical wiring coming in. Um, but the, uh, the kit is, is pretty simple uh, as well. So, because you know, you open it, uh, switch it on, and, and there you go. Uh, in terms of uh, specs, um, what what you need is a is a laser. It needs to be pulsed. Um, the repetition rate is literally uh, limited by uh, the lifetime, which is also tells you a little bit about the jitter. And the pulse duration has to be uh, also. Uh, no longer than 15 picoseconds. Uh, you can do a little bit less than that. So, because it's a fully, uh, you know, assembled system. So, you know, when we say effective brightness, that means something that you get uh, after the round trip. So, once it's out there, and uh, it's the kind of spec that is going to be maintained through the time. So, you put it there; it should sit there for, uh, you know, you know, tens of tens of thousands of hours uh, for yourself and. Uh, you know, G2 uh, as well, pretty low. Um, single form distinguishability, uh, you know, it's at least 90%, could be more. Um, so these are kind of baseline specs that you'd expect from a decent uh, single photon source. Um, but again, I mean, it could be done better uh, if you're wanting to give away some of the simplicity. So certainly can do some custom orders. Uh, but I guess our interest is, uh, is making sure that if you don't have your quantum optics lab, uh, ready there, uh, we can bring it to you and uh, it'd be super easy uh, to set up. Um, so with that, 
uh, I would like to say that, 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 you know, that's it. It's super simple. Um, just, uh, you know, send us a message and uh, we'd we'll be, we'll be ready to have a chat, you know, whether it's an integration project, a research project, or just, you know, something we can help you with. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very okay. much, Maxim. Yeah, it was quicker than you expected, I suppose, no? Yeah. No, yes. Thank you. This was a uh, very informative. And um, so we already have a few questions for you. Uh, Juan from the University of Vienna. Hi. Um, thank you for the nice talk, actually. Um, I'm curious about first, what is the lifetime of the signal? Okay. And mm -hmm. because you were mentioning 10 gigahertz uh, line width and then limited by the maximum repetition, uh, so, it was also uh, high. That would be uh, first question. Yeah, so the lifetime, which is also driving your jitter, right? Uh, so the uncertainty on the emission of the single photon source. So it's uh, it's less than 15 picoseconds. Uh, 15 picosecond? Yeah, one five, yeah. It's, it's pretty okay. fast, yeah. Yeah, and this efficiency that you uh, advertise there of 50%, mm -hmm. do you refer this like to the final efficiency after all filtering? Yeah. yeah. Basically, so your signal. Yeah, right so zero. basically, if you got the fiber out, and uh, this is what you're going to be measuring uh, on your photodiode. So if you pump at 80 megahertz, you get more than 40 megahertz ready to be detected yeah. with that quality. Yeah. Of yeah. One. Okay, thanks. Um, how are we, Panos, how are we doing on, on, with time? Because uh, maybe we should uh, go ahead to the next speaker already. Yes, yes, if there is no time, it would be great. If there's no other question, sorry, it would be great to go to, go to the next speaker. <laughs> so I will introduce the next speaker, Ivan. Uh, uh, it will be Marie Villard, the quality performance manager from Quantella. Marie, the floor is yours. Okay. So, so, can you see my screen? Yes, everything is good. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. So, my name is Marie Villard, and uh, today I will present uh, you a part of the Candela's work about the building of an optical quantum computer from the academic research in semiconductor quantum dots. So um, quantum computing is one of the space race of the century. Many companies, many research groups uh, are working on this subject uh, from different technologies, so photonic, ion, uh, supraconductors, and, uh, and many others. Uh, but uh, today I will focus on photonics because it's uh, Candela's work. So to build, uh, so just an overview of uh, what could be an optical uh, quantum computer. So it's first a qubit generator, the circuit to uh, compute operations on chip, and the detectors to read the result. So on each layer, you have different actors, and Candela is mostly working on the qubit generator right now. So uh, for the technology, so photonics, so we are working with photons, which uh, is a light particle with no mass and no electrical charge. So this means that uh, the photon has an infinite current time and we can manipulate uh, it at room temperature. Uh, and to be useful, the source has to be first bright. So uh, we uh, all found Cecil uh, already did some uh, definitions. So it's just the same, so brightness, so we have an on-demand source. Uh, it's very useful because the, the more photons we have, the less time we need to do uh, operations because it's divided by a factor of 10 to the N, N is the number of photons. And so the processing power exponentially increased with the number of qubits. Single photons emitted by the source to make sure that we just have one photon in each waveguide on the, on the chip. And with photons to encode qubit, we use so the upper uh, waveguide for zero and a lower waveguide for one. So with one photon, we are sure about this encoding. And uh, to do quantum 
uh, operations. So on chip, uh, we have to do quantum correlation and it's uh, only possible when we have indistinguishable photons. So this is the third, third benchmark of the sources where all the emitted photons have the same physical properties. And so when you have two single photons interfering on the beam splitter on the chip, you can do quantum operations. So the Candela's technology is based on quantum dots. So this is an artificial atom emitting in all directions. And to control the direction of the emissions to coupling uh, the emitted photons, we put this quantum dot into a micropillar, which is a cavity which um, confine the mode in the three directions and ends the emission of the single photons toward the top of the micropillar. And these emitted photons are highly coupling uh, into a single bot fiber. Uh, the Candela's device looks like that. So you have the micropillar. The quantum dot is almost at the middle of this micropillar. The structure around enables an electrical connection and, uh, of, the, of the device to uh, increase the indistinguishability of the photons. And on one device, you can have several different sources. But these sources are in free space. So like in all uh, academic group, we need uh, big tables, optical tables, cryostats, uh, free space uh, optical system. So it's not fitting into racks uh, such as in data uh, centers. So we are working on fibered sources, which means that we can uh, directly place an optical fiber above uh, the pillar we want to use. And we have uh, the brightest deterministic source uh, for the moment. So with the 7% so, uh, detected. So after all the optical system and uh, considering the coupling uh, between the source and the fiber, this structure can be placed into a standard crosstat, which is the same crosstat as in the photon uh, detectors. So this means that uh, we are uh, working on uh, placing both in the same uh, crosstat. So if some companies are interested with, uh, for working with us uh, about this project, uh, we are we would be happy to work with you. Um, and so uh, when everything, so the, emitting, uh, the emitter and the detector are at 4K in the same crosstat, we have a compact system and we can think about uh, manipulating uh, the photons emitted by our source with uh, optical devices, so at room temperature, so from different provider. And we uh, developed uh, optical modules to send uh, a certain number of photons uh, at the same time on the chip. So for the moment, we have six qubits. So we can work with six inputs uh, uh, photonic chip. Uh, and we are um, developing a simulator to make a simulation on what happened on the chip to make the comparison with our experimental results. And this simulator, so Perceval, uh, could also us to design the future uh, chip we want to, uh, to use. So Candela has an uh, all-in-one product, which uh, has a human size with uh, the single photon source, all the modules, optical modules required to use the source. And by placing in the same structure uh, the different photonic chip, we are uh, building uh, the European Photonic Quantum Computer Mosaic. So thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, do not hesitate. Thanks a lot, Marie. This, uh, this was a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, nice to see that you already have some uh, collaborations there with some other Epic members. I saw Quicks, I saw Lizentech. Um, and we saw that we are turning to be a quantum computing or uh, quantum photonic computing company slowly, slowly, and this is amazing. And um, I don't see any question for the moment, but uh, I can ask something to you. Uh, yeah. Since you are um, uh, starting building up your quantum photonic computer now, can you please let us know what are your needs uh, uh, currently, in, either into your supply chain or in any potential collaboration you would need? 
um, do you have packaging? Do you have uh, whatever you would like to to have? You know, in our audience, we have people from all the supply chains. So, uh, well, uh, so as uh, you saw that we we already have the so the Prometheus, which is the the rack. Um, we we would like to integrate everything. So really for the single photon detectors inside uh, the same cryostat, it could be very great because for the moment, there is just the source inside the cryostat and the single photon detectors are outside. So maybe it could be uh, for better integrations. Um, and then it's about the, the chip. So we are uh, simulating chips. We are, uh, and so we don't have the knowledge in Candela uh, to uh, to build the, those chips, uh, so we can simulate them, but uh, we can't do them. Uh, so yeah, for this part, it could be cool as well. Um, after that, for the packaging, it's still uh, under progress because uh, for for the moment, the the result we have uh, on chip are still uh, in the lab part, so not on this blue uh, blue box. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's still with the big cross that, and uh, but uh, we are working on uh, making everything compact. So, and I assume you you would you would plan to keep the stirring of the photons outside of the cryostat. Sorry. Are you planning to keep the stirring of the photons, the manipulation, the photonic chip outside of the cryostat? Uh, yes, yes, because we can manipulate them uh, at room temperature. So for the cross it's just the emitter and the detector, and everything else okay. is outside. So it's very, very small chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for the answer. Uh, but we have one more question now from uh, from Kevin. Yeah. Kevin uh, from Quantum uh, Optics, Siena. Hello. Hey, Marie. Very hey. interesting talk. Uh, I'm wondering, so uh, you mentioned you have six qubits at the moment. Uh, yeah. So what's your roadmap for the future? Since everybody may know this thousand yeah. qubits from IBM <laughs> next year. So I'm wondering yeah. about the scalability of, of your system. Yeah, uh, so um, we already proceed uh, two photons. So the basic and it's working. We have a new chip, uh, which is still a... Uh, under uh, study with six. Um, we are working for maybe double it. Uh, the main issue is the brightness and the losses. Uh, so for the source brightness, uh, it's around 50% before uh, anything. And so the, the the yeah the main issue is all the losses of the optical system and the fiber so we are trying to uh, reduce all the size so that's why having everything in the same cross set could be better for the insertion the losses uh, in fibers mostly so we hope that uh, we so, so yes it's six by the end of the year and then we hope that uh, we can maybe double it each year. So for this part, it's still uh, under progress, but uh, six is uh, is okay for the, the end of the year. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, we have one more question that comes from Charles Goerling uh, from Micron Photonics. Bonjour, Hello. Charles. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marie, for, for your talk. So um, I think we, we, we came to the to the losses uh, discussion just just to know if how do you couple your light simply between between your single photon sources and the optical fiber. So I see that it's now completely a, a package and uh, it seems to, to work very well. And how do you couple it? And do you have some um, some challenges there? Oh yeah, there are, there are many. <laughs> Uh, so it's a uh, full work of, so it's not my work, it's a uh, colleague work, but uh, yeah, it's very challenging because the pillar is around two microns. Uh, so we found um, a single mode fiber, uh, which has the, almost the same core uh, diameter. And then it's a, a precision work to uh, place the the fiber above the, the 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 pillar and then screw everything glue everything uh, to make sure that it won't move when we put it at 4k because everything is done at room temperature so it's really the um, the work of uh, of a team to make sure that everything is working and 
it's quite new that we can reach those uh, brightness and uh, we, we we know that we can improve some stuff so it's not uh, it's not the end for this part but it's still under progress okay nice thank you marie thank you charles uh we have one more question from uh Yes, thank you for the talk. I, I was interested uh, for these quantum applications. Is it possible? Is there any chance that the photo detectors can also be kept at room temperature? For example, if you use a SPAD or or such a such a device. Uh, well, I think it's uh, so. It's the same answer as before. It's uh, our wavelength is around nine twenty. So for the efficiency, uh, it seems that SPDs, uh, SNPDs. Uh, are the more efficient with uh, something like 70% if I remember well uh, percent efficiency so we can have a look uh, on SPAD uh, I, I took everything on my on my notebook uh, to see if we, it could be a, a solution but yeah for the moment uh, we did that emitters and detector should be at 4k well for the, the source it's uh, the same as power quantum 10K could be okay, uh, more than distinguishability uh, will decrease. But uh, for the detector, we, we will see. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we don't have any other question and we can go to the next speaker. But before that, I would like to ask uh, Kevin Fusser from Quantum Optics uh, uh, Jena if he can show us what he's doing there. Yeah, sure. Uh, th uh, thanks a lot. So let me uh, let me just sh share my screen. Uh, I hope this works now. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the typical the typical epic question. Uh, what can we do for you? So we we fabricate uh, QKD systems based on entanglement or based on entangled photons. So uh, we have customized photon source at different wavelengths at 800 nanometer, at uh, 50 nanometer, and 1300 nanometer. And of course, if you do QKD, you have to measure quantum states. So we have uh, yeah, one of a kind quantum state analyzer system. And of course, everything you need um, to build a QKD protocol to have your key management software running and also the automation to running uh, such QKD system uh, 24 seven. What do we need? Uh, we need, of course, single photon detectors. So that's the reason why we are participating at the moment. So um, feel free to come to us uh, if you are interested to, uh, to learn more about QKT systems with entanglement. And of course, if you have an interesting detector um, system, feel also free to come to us or to, uh, to speak to us uh, because we are every time interested to learn uh, what are the possibilities in the future uh, for detecting our photons. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. You already triggered some questions from the from the audience. I'm sure that it's related to QKD comes from Benjamin. But before going to Benjamin, I would like to ask uh, Charles because he wants to give a solution to present a solution to Marie uh, regarding the 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 coupling. Uh, Charles, you would like to show us the yeah yeah thanks. some slides. No, I, I'm not saying that I will I will bring a solution to Mario. I'm not no, no, that, but... just just so what? To make a stream, huh? <laughs> I'll try try uh, to, to share my screen. So, okay, it should work now. Can you see my screen? Perhaps I will put it yeah. in full screen. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so just quickly, uh, yeah, it's the occasion to, to present uh, what we are doing at Icon Photonics. So, so we are a French company also in uh, created in 2018. You are bringing uh, solutions from the from datacom and telecom uh, markets to the quantum applications. So just in a few words, um, try to show you what we can do here. For example, you can see an embedded chip. So it can represent a one by four channel, for example. And we are adding photonics and electronic solutions directly at the chip level. So our, our main idea is really to bring added value to the chip in general. So here you can see, for example, a uh, first layer that is taking all the coupling uh, enhancements of, of the chips. So with the aim to increase the coupling efficiency, reduce the insertion losses. And a second layer, for example, that can help to, to insert the optical fibers. So it can be a single fiber. It can be also arrays. So that's the generic idea is really to move to fully passive alignment of uh, large arrays of fibers with, uh, with uh, structures that can be uh, uh, single photon sources, detectors, also grating couplers 
etc. And just in the last slide to present a few things that we can offer also for edge copying that is uh, can be an issue also. So the generic ID is uh, always the same. Uh, we can take the chip that you can see here. We we integrate it in, in a kind of optical microbench or interposer. We could we could uh, talk like that, and then insert this kind of structures. So with a mode field converter uh, and a passive alignment of uh, of a fibers array. So I will stop there and uh, let uh, let Benjamin is, ask his question. Okay. Okay, no, no, but uh, I wanted to have more question uh, that, that comes from Guadela. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Marie, I hope uh, you will uh, manage yes. to get in contact with Charles. I will ask some questions. I have, I already have some questions, but it for, it's for later. <laughs> no, no, yes, maybe we can keep it for later because we're running out of time. Yeah. One more question, though, uh, for you from uh, uh, from the YouTube comes from the world of the YouTube. So, how do we define deterministicity and on demand for your source? So, you can just quickly elaborate on that. Uh, it's for me. No, sorry. Yes, it's for you. <laughs> so, deterministic. Uh, so, it's um, so the sources are deterministic because we um, we have um, a technology, uh, well, uh, an optical system with a cross stat where we can uh, identify where are the quantum dots. So the artificial atoms, and then we can uh, mark where they are and create the structure around them. So it's not just a random creation of uh, etch uh, etching to make pillars. Uh, it's really we detect where are the quantum dots, we mark the place, and then we etch the micro pillar around uh, with an accuracy around 50 micro uh, nanometer. Mm -hmm. Micron is uh, it's too large, um, which means that uh, the quantum dot is at the center, and so the enhancements, the the the, the resonance is uh, almost done. So that's why we have this uh, uh, electrical tunability to make uh, the energy of the quantum dot uh, at the resonance with the cavity. Uh, and then the fiber uh, part is also deterministic because we, uh, when we have this structure with all the pillar, we can look at the pillars uh, separately, find the best one, and then place the, the fiber precisely above uh, the pillar we want. So this is deterministic from the beginning to the end. Okay, Maria, thanks a lot. And I think now we should uh, uh, stop a yeah. little bit with quantum computing applications. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot for the talk. Thanks a lot for the answers. Thanks, uh, the people, for the questions. I would love to go back to Kevin and to Benjamin. So Benjamin has a question from Kevin. Yeah, sure. I, actually, I have to now with the presentation of Charles. Uh, maybe okay. I will I will start just for Kevin. My question is, what is a wave wavelength exactly? Because you, because you were talking about integral photon source and you were looking also maybe for photon detectors. So what are the wavelengths that are of interest for you? It's mostly customized, um, so we uh, uh, we speak with our customers what kind of bands he's um, giving us, and then we can uh, create the source in a way that it fits uh, for the customer needs. So it's it's adaptable at this point. Okay, okay, fine. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, okay. my so my other question to Charles was uh, if if your your process is wavelength free. Um, or if you have like some kind of uh, limitation in terms of wavelength, of wavelength for coping. Yeah, so concerning, uh, concerning the wavelengths, in fact, uh, we have some limitation, of course, but it's uh, really a narrow limitation, I would say. So to, to be simple, we, we can walk uh, without any issue between 500 nanometers and uh, uh, 4 micron. Okay. So under, uh, under 500 nanometers, it, it begins to, to, to be difficult, even if we, we can find some, uh, some ways to walk there. And perhaps also some, something to add, uh, we are working at cryogenic uh, uh, temperature. So both cryogenic or not cryogenic. So that's something we can, we can discuss also. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so Benjamin, I think we don't have any other question and you are exactly in the good place for it because you are the next speaker. So you can start sharing your slides. Yeah, sure. Just see my screen. Perfect. Nice and okay. smooth. The floor is okay. yours. Thank you. So I'll try to introduce the company quickly. So my name is Benjamin. I'm uh, I'm, the, I'm now the head of Space Business Unit for Quantum Technologies. So I'm formerly the, the sales manager in EMEA for EA Technology. So right now, I will try to introduce quickly the company, the structure, and make a quick focus on the 
on the application, especially regarding the ending of photon source and the detection. So basically, uh, who are we? So Aurea Technology, we are a small French company based in the Eastern France. We are 100% EU27 company, which means that we are eligible for the Euro QCI call running right now. And the core business of Aurea Technology is manufacturing, designing and manufacturing the key building blocks for optical quantum communication, and especially uh, the, the photon sources and the uh, near infrared photon counters. Right now, we are working with more than 300 customers worldwide, mostly, mostly in Europe and in the US. And uh, they say that the company has a strong uh, knowledge of the optical quantum technologies since our R&D team is coming from quantum communication. So we can bring a technical and integration support to a customer as well as a scientific support for the people who are involved, newly involved, let's say, in optical quantum communication. So at Aurea, we are not, uh, let's say, building QKD system, but we are helping our customer to do so. So, and for that, we are helping them with technical integration and most, mostly scientific support. So in terms of structure right now in Europe, we have three, three uh, let's say, three pillars. There is the European project side represented by Mrs. Lola Cortia. So if you have some ideas for the European project, she's the contact. Zoeb is now the person in charge of the sales in the EU. And myself, Benjamin, I'm responsible for all the space business units for quantum technologies and for quantum communication. So now I'll focus more on the technological side. It's the, let's say, the title of the, of the meeting. So right now, Real Technology, we are developing, uh, let's say, three main type of instruments with a core expertise in the photon detection. So basically, uh, the, the expertise of Aurea technology is uh, focused on the 1550 wavelengths. We have solution in the A10 band, but right now we are focusing more on the 1550 wavelengths. So we are working in the difference with the different topics that you have seen until now is that now uh, at Aurea technology, we are working with room temperature technologies. So for the photon detection, we are using mostly, for example, in, in gas pads, and for the photon generation, uh, we are using nonlinear crystal and generating entangled photon pairs. So it's really pairs. It's not like a single photon source, it's entangled photon pairs. And our goal is really to help our customer, especially in the field of uh, entanglement distribution and all the, um, the communication system and quantum communication system based on entanglement. So ent and uh, especially at the 1550, uh, 1550 um, wavelength. So, Right now, this, let, let's say that these technologies are deployed on ground, but we are moving more and more towards space because indeed with the new calls specifically pushed by the Rocky CI project, uh, there is a need for uh, the deployment of this technology also on, in, into space. Uh, the main reason is driven by the lack of the, of the quantum repeaters and the limitation in terms of distance for the propagation of the photons in optical fiber. So right now we are thinking of the system, more complex system, with an entangled photon source in space and optical ground station, as mentioned by single quantum, with optical ground station and photon detection on ground. Uh, the idea is really to link very uh, point very split apart by like thousands of kilometers, things that you can do with optical fiber uh, unless you are using safe nodes. So now uh, some ideas have emerged with the with the with the goal to put this entangled photon source into space. So right now. At Aurea Technology, let's say that everything on ground is especially uh, look, um, focused on the three main uh, building blocks that you can see here. Everything is available now. So to answer some of the questions I've seen already is that, uh, I mean, if you can, you can order it and have it tomorrow if you wish. So we are working with, in terms of scalability because we see that there is a need also for a scalable, for a scalability in terms of volume, uh, if, even if we want to develop like an industrial infrastructure in, in Europe. And to do so, we are also working with different type, with different partners to help us going toward this uh, this complete uh, industrial knowledge and supply chain. So, Aurea Technology is a, a plain part of the supply chain of the quantum key distribution, uh, if and uh, entanglement distribution, let's say. So, one of the applications I've mentioned here is the space segment. Uh, indeed, we are working with our customers on ground, but if, as for space, I've took one of the projects that we have if don't evolve, involved in. That is that's concerned both the photon source and the photon detection. So in that case, the photon source is into space. So we've um, with a, we have targeted uh, let's say one gigahertz per generation rate. Actually, now the project is coming to an end, and we have achieved almost every steps. So right now we have a source working with 10 gigahertz 
So 10 years, well, it's 10 gigapers per second. We are generating 10 gigapers per second at 1550 and um, with a maximum visibility, visibility for those who are not very um, familiar with the um, entangled photon source is more or less the quality factor for entanglement. So right now we are working with a very good entangled photon source. And for what we've seen now, it should be possible to send it to space. So indeed additional development are required to see if it's possible, but still in terms of performance, we have achieved what was required. And the, things is, the thing is important is that this source will be available, uh, commercially available by the end of the year. So we'll make a source that is available on ground because indeed with such performances, it should be, it's now possible to distribute a large amount of photon on ground and maybe imagine some, uh, some ground networks based on entanglement. So especially for protocols such as BBM92, for example. So as mentioned, uh, we, we fully support the Euro PCI infrastructure. I will not go into details, but just know that right now, Aurea Technology is looking also for partner in this frame with the three main uh, topics that are the photon sources, because we are working on the new generation of photon sources. So the, if, if some people are involved in this type of, um, of this part of technology, would like to go toward new application. Indeed, we, are, we, are, we can help and we, we can help and participate. In terms of photon detection, we are working with SPADs and going toward more and more the performance of the nanowire detectors that, has indeed, that are indeed the state-of-the-art detectors in terms of performance. But right now, the best they say, trade-off for the infrastructure would be something with the performance of the SNSPD and the integration in the, in the, in the footprint of uh, SPAD detectors, so something that holds in the hands. Indeed, this required a lot of, uh, let's say, research and developments. There is some leads, but still, this need, this need a lot of work. So right now, this is the three main topics in which we are looking uh, a lot of partners. This is just a quick reminder. We are, we can, we are looking for partnership, new customer integrated in ground and space optical quantum technologies, not just QKD, but also for the entanglement distribution. So right now we are working on this topic with different customers in the US and the EU. So of course, if, if you have some ideas of some project that involve photon sources, photon detectors, or any QKG building blocks, feel free to contact us. We can help, but we also we also would probably need help, especially in the frame of uh, the Euro QCI project. So that's it. Indeed, if you have more questions for me, do not hesitate. I'm here. There's also my colleagues that I've presented quickly. Benjamin, uh, Benjamin, myself, Lola, and Zoeb, they are fully available, so you can check them by email. And uh, indeed, we are open to collaboration, so feel free to contact us if needed. Okay, mm, thank you, Benjamin. So this was uh, very, very clear what uh, you can offer for the others and uh, what uh, what uh, our, our other partners can do for you. Um, so let's see if we have some questions. Uh, Kevin from Quantum Optics, Jena. Yeah, many thanks for the talk. Uh, do you do you can comment on the uh, um, telescope size which you used for the uh, um, for the key demonstration in space? So what what kind of aperture uh, you expect to have for ten yeah. minutes? So indeed, the the telescope is a big topic right now. If you are aware of what's happening in the European Commission, so there is two approach. That there is the A10 nanometer approach and the 1550 approach. Indeed, using 1550, you have like a beam divergence, especially if you are in free space. So you need larger telescopes. Right now, in, in, a, in our project, we were not required to use some of these telescopes. We are still on an early stage project. The idea was to, uh, let's say, have a proof of concept, see if it's possible to reach these performances. So we proved that it should be possible. Indeed, in terms of develop, development, uh, I, I can let the floor to, uh, to institutes such as TNO, for example, who has a strong expertise in this, in this domain. But there is, a, a, let's say, a, a strong no, there's still a debate in, around the size of the telescope. So it will depend on the architecture that you will choose because we are not talking, if you're talking about like one station, one ground station in each country, then you can imagine to have a telescope that's worth maybe 50 million or 100 million, I don't know. But if you are planning to use, for example, hundreds of telescopes all around Europe, uh, you will have troubles using very large apertures. So indeed, the question is not only technical, it's also about the budget link that you want to implement. And this is not in our hands, unfortunately. But okay. indeed, the bigger the telescope, the better, because you will catch more light. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, Jesse from uh, Single Quantum. Yeah, so very interesting talk. Uh, so uh, I'm especially interested in the uh, space uh, project you mentioned, quantum space project. Could you comment on the technolo uh, technological challenges uh, of this project? For You mean for the detection, for the quantum communication, generally? Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned this uh, quantum space project, uh, yeah. just in general, for example, regarding coupling to the telescope or something, mm -hmm. uh, very interested. So there's an interesting topic. Uh, actually, there is an interesting conclusion to the project. And what is some, some kind of reassuring is that we all coming to the same conclusion is that there is a technical bottleneck on the detectors, actually. And maybe you probably know it, but uh, right now for the quantum communication, there's trade-off, there is some trade-off issue about the trade-off because it's uh, you have to find a trade-off between the cost and the performances. Right now, it's not quite um, clear about whether to choose between the silicon or the in-gas platform because indeed in silicon, you have great performance, small detectors, but still you have some issue if you want to propagate the signal through optical fiber. So it's about finding the best architecture. So I would say right now, uh, there is a, a strong debate on the architecture of the system. In terms of technology, we have some very good technical layer. Uh, layer. Uh, for the source, we have developed something that works quite well. I know that single quantum, for example, have very nice uh, nanowire detectors that work very well. Now the question is about how do you uh, deploy this on ground? And right now, again, it's not, we don't have the, 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 the question is actually in the hand of the European Commission, unfortunately. It's not a technical debate, it's a political debate. But I would say that right now, the technological bottleneck would be the detectors. Having the performance really of the SNSPD and the footprint of, uh, of, um, of a SPAT detector would be the best trade-off possible, but still need some work, I would say. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, James from Technology Innovation Institute. Hi, yeah, thanks for the, uh, the talk, Benjamin. That's very interesting to hear from, uh, from what you guys are up to. Um, I just had a question about the, the space segment. So if you're, if you're doing entangled sources in space, I imagine this is like a, I mean, you have two, two choices, right? The double down, downlink architecture, where you send both photons to the ground, or a single downlink architecture. And if, you, if you're doing a single downlink, then this means you need to detect one of the photons in the satellite, right? So I think possibly you touched on you touched on this in the previous answer actually. But are you planning on on putting the Aurea detectors in space as well? In which case, will they be in gas, or are you moving to visible light so you can use silicon? So I understand there's maybe two questions in your question. Yeah. If I'm right. Go. Uh, so for the source, basically, if I understand correctly, and if, if not correctly, but uh, still, if uh, w the plan is to have a, two downlinks, one to the left and one to the right, to simplify the problem because you need like two ground station. The idea is that you connect them through entanglement. So you need two link starting from the satellites. And um, so you have indeed, you need indeed two ground stations. I don't know if it was one of the questions, but uh, we sent- No, but it, it answers the other question because it means you yeah. don't need to put one of your detectors in space, right? So, it's, so. In, in, in terms of sending the detectors into space, um, we are thinking about it. Uh, mm -hmm. There is discussion right now that I cannot talk, uh, that I cannot, I cannot say much more about it because it's still in the discussion. Uh, we have been, contacted indeed to put these detectors into space. Uh, it's not without a challenge, let's say, to, some, to put some SPAD into space, uh, but uh, we are thinking about it. I cannot give like a very precise and concise answer, okay. but Would this be the in-gas in space detectors or is this the, I know you guys have the in-gas system, right? Yeah, Could yeah, in-gas, in in-gas, in yeah. Right. So as long as you publish, as long as you publish this stuff eventually, I'm, I'm happy. And we know a lot about how silicon detectors work in space and well, how, they, how they gradually degrade. Yeah, but uh, there's not much information about in gas. So I'd be very curious to see how that works. Yeah, that, that's why it's challenging. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, great. Let's let's just take one one more question, and then uh, the, um, we'll have an informal discussion after this um, online technology meeting. So please stay until the end. Uh, we can continue discussing with Benjamin. So Matthew from INO, uh, did you have something in mind? Yeah, yeah, I have plenty in mind, but <laughs> I will restrain myself. Um, basically, so it's it's really interesting to to look at the uh, you know eventuality of 
uh, using your technology in space and so on. But uh, one question is, how do you manage it? How do you manage the usability of your system during daylight? Um, because actually, you have yeah. you, you have yeah. a lot of sources. You know, if you get integral sources in orbit and your ground station is looking upwards, you will have you know the diffraction from the sky. So mm -hmm. that will blind your detector. And the other way around, the same. So because basically you have, you know, Earth gets its own albedo. And so the detector will be also blind due to the incoming light from, you know, the solar reflections. Yeah. So uh, how do you manage to, you know, tackle this? Yeah. So there is, it's a very complete question and uh, I will not be able to answer fully. Let's say for the wavelengths at 1550, you have issue that in the visible wavelengths, you have more less background noise, especially. So That's in right. daylight, there is, less issue at 1550. There's been demonstration by the Chinese at 18 that works, but only if you are in the shadow in the shadow of Earth. So mm -hmm. there is a proof of concept in the shadow of Earth in during, let's say, nighttime. For daylight, we've shown that, in, I mean, it's, it's like you are using spads in during daylight. You can use spads, uh, in gas spads during in daylight. I mean, you will detect, you will have noise, sure, but still works. But, uh, what we have to do also is a, a very narrow, uh, I mean, probably a narrow filtering of the, your signal, be sure of what you are looking at and using probably your audio detector in a gating mode instead okay. of precise mode, for example. That some ideas just to get rid of the backlight that you could have. Okay, and uh, maybe a follow-on question on that, and I know that in gas cannot, cannot go up to that wavelength, but why don't you go in the three five micron region, for instance? Because you you get less less light. We could. Uh, we don't have the expertise. <laughs> Actually, right now we don't have the technology to go to these wavelengths. Uh, we are at, at. I mean, at Uria, we have a good knowledge of the telecom C band and uh, this region, this this let's say uh, wavelength region. But we do not have the technology and the knowledge right now to go up in the free five region. I know that it's trade off that are look, ESA is looking at this region because, indeed, as you mentioned, it, there are several advantages to go, to go there. But as for Aurea is concerned, I cannot really answer uh, other things that saying just that we don't have the expertise. Indeed, it will be interesting, but uh, still, I don't have the knowledge of what is available, commercially available or industrially available in this region in terms of entangled photon sources and photon detection technology. Okay, so maybe we need to talk. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right. but, I, but I will have another question, but uh, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's time to... <laughs> yeah, you have my, yeah, you have my contact. If you want to discuss, it would be, it would be a pleasure. Okay, but, good. Um, yeah, thank I, you. I invite, I invite you both and uh, also everyone in the room to just stay uh, for another 15 minutes and then we have a, an informal session to discuss, uh, to continue discussing for as long as we want. So there is uh, just one more person that uh, wants to tell us about her company, Olga from uh, Laser Components. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> and thank you, Ivan Ayotis and Helena. So, uh, I am still very uh, excited about the detectors of uh, uh, Benjamin. I have a few questions to him, but maybe afterwards. Let me share my screen. Let's uh, just a moment. Yeah. So, this, this is, this is uh, as I said, uh, very excited about the 15, 15 nanometers. Um, this is, this is a very challenging uh, technology. So in our particular topic today, single photon emitters as well as detectors are ex extremely challenging. So for detectors, is a, it is an all-in-one, it's required on, all-in-one device for any purpose. Low dark current rate, high detection efficiency, low after pulse probability, um, large active area, but st stable, high standard, industrial quality as well. So what can we expect from such a detector? Just to give you a feeling, to detect single photons, we uh, need really very low dark count rate. In case of our single photon avalanche detectors, counts even below 10 dark counts per second are possible. And with an active area of 100 microns, it's very small, but still handleable. So sometimes uh, single photon avalanche detectors are compared with photomultipliers, 
this comparison is not really true for me because the detector efficiency here is incomparable high with more than 75% for red region and even more than 60-65% for near infrared. To illustrate this, uh, I show you two examples for uh, applications. The photon correlation spectroscopy and the dynamic light scattering on the left uh, applied for living cells create a broad spectrum of application areas in life sciences using the Doppler shift measurements on moving particles. Uh, the dynamic uh, be behavior of a molecule can be observed live and also particle sizing can be evaluated. The limits are below one nanometer of a particle on a smaller side or over micron on a biggest particle size. Um, the necessi necessity <laughs> to detect of very faint scattered light makes the spats unavoidable for this application. On the other hand, on the right, uh, you can again see quantum cryptography. We had a lot of interesting talks today about quantum applications. Quantum key distribution means the usage of quantum communication to secure and uh, generate a key for two parties, for A, Alice, and B, Bob, <laughs> for the same communication. It requires single photons as emitters with correlated quantum states. And of course, both Alice and Bob need single photon detectors. So to memorize the question, the key epic questions, what can EPIC members do for us? Challenge us with your exciting requirements and impossible applications. So what we can do for you, hand in hand with you, we will elaborate the best solution in your application. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Olga. Bo both EPIC and EPIC members will do their best. Um, all right, let me introduce the next speaker because we're kind of running short on time. Uh, Johan Zestin from uh, KI3 Photonics. Hi, Ivan. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, going to share my screen. So can everybody see my screen now? Okay, so yeah, first of all, I would really like to thank uh, EPIC and the, the organizer of this meeting for giving me the opportunity to present my company, which is called K3 Photonics. Uh, I have to say that I'm a, a really big fan of what EPIC is doing. And I think you guys are doing a, a really great job in uh, connecting people from the, from the phono photonic industry, uh, not only in Europe, but also everywhere around the world. So a, a big thank you for this. So yeah, my name is uh, Johan Justin. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of K3 Photonics. And I'd like to present you today what the, what the company is doing, in particular for uh, quantum resource distribution through uh, entanglement. So a little bit, uh, a little word about us. Uh, K3 Photonics is a, a university spin-off from the INRS is called the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique. And uh, we are based in Montreal, Canada. So we are not from Europe, uh, coming from North America. And uh, we basically develop quantum photonic hardware with the vision to really try to pave the way for uh, digitally inclusive quantum networks. So in particular, we really want to try to provide energy efficient uh, photonic systems featuring a low footprint in order to ensure, for example, the um, secure metropolitan transmission of quantum information like qubits. And we want to do so by uh, leveraging the optical fiber infrastructure that is already in place uh, for the generation, manipulation, distribution of uh, quantum signals. And these for, let's say, uh, quantum networks that are going to work with parallel and multi-channel information processing. So what do we propose for that actually? So one of the key building blocks that, that, that we have and that the, the, the company uh, proposed 
is a, a quantum source that can generate entangled photons on more than 50 different ITU channels. So it's the key element to, to build the future quantum networks uh, as it provides a versatile solution for the distribution of entangled photons to different users. And all of this through a single quantum channel that is gonna be compatible with the current optical fiber infrastructure. So basically combines uh, fiber optics and integrated components. Uh, we actually work at room temperature room temperature and it does not also require the use of uh, bulky external lasers or nonlinear crystals that would be a bit more fragile but just optical amplifi optical amplifiers uh, let's say off the shelf telecommunication components and uh, nonlinear non integrated microchip uh, ring cavities so as I said before, we really try to put the emphasis on the, on the fact that it is compatible with the existing optical fiber infrastructure. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be able to have an efficient information traffic management. And uh, by using integrated optics and let's say off the shelf telecommunication components, we can have in this case, a device that is uh, relatively uh, a low cost approach. So, the question is the what what's the magic be, behind that and how can we generate photon pairs over 50 different ITU channel so the idea was really to make use of uh, optical frequency comb that are basically light sources with a broad spectrum of uh, evenly spaced frequency modes so this can be made on chip and in particular by exciting a micro cavity resonance via uh, spontaneous four-wave mixing in a K3 material. So now I guess uh, you understand the name of the company, why we are called K3 Photonics. It's making reference of the, the material that we are using to, let's say, generate our photons. So today there are basically several uh, multi-channel sources that are based on, let's say, this quantum frequency comb now that have already been demonstrated with different types of excitation, can be continuous, wave, or uh, light, um, or pulsed light. But, you know, the, the, the schemes that are, that was used uh, to date, um, so even if they might use an integrated chip, they also use usually a, a very bulky laser in order to, to pump the, the integrated chip. So in this case, uh, the device that we propose is one of the, for the first time, we came up with a, a practical scheme uh, that gets rid of this bulky laser and that can have make a device, let's say, that is completely uh, integrable into a, a rack standard mount that can be after integrated in, uh, let's say, uh, telecommunication systems and things like that. So, What's next with the with the, this source of uh, photons? So we are now basically finishing the the packaging of the of the source. We were using integrated chips that we had in, uh, at the university. Now we are uh, it's in close collaboration with uh, Legend Tech that is going to bring us some uh, new chips, and we have starting to have amazing results uh, thanks to these very exceptional uh, chips. And we will soon integrate our source into a, a QKD test bed. So first into the lab, then we're gonna try to demonstrate, uh, let's say the networking opportunity of the source, and then try to put it this in the, into a, a real life environment. And also thanks to the versatility of the source, uh, we are now going to use uh, multiple degrees of freedom in order to encode the information. So in particular, uh, we can generate more complex quantum schemes uh, such as hyper entanglement or cluster states uh, where time and frequency encoding uh, will be used simultaneously. So this makes, let's say, uh, those cluster state very more stable for the distribution to the, the fiber network uh, communication. Uh, for example. And finally, as a, as a long-term vision, we are really uh, planning to have uh, full integration. So 
the laser out of the source, uh, everything integrated into, into a chip in order to increase, let's say, the, the scalability of the, of the system. So yeah, so this is the, the short overview of what Kai Free Photonics is doing. So I was just going to show you uh, how we want to use entangled photons for a networking application. And finally, to answer the, the famous epic question, uh, I think, how can I help? I think we can help you by sharing our expertise in the generation, manipulation of quantum signals. And how, how you could help us is really trying to partner with us, uh, especially if you are a specialist in QKD, uh, software management for the distribution of the keys on something like this. Want to integrate the source in a, a quantum test bed. Uh, so feel free to, to contact me if you, if you want more information. So thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much, Johan. Uh, uh, this is great. This is great uh, also that you already partner with uh, other Epic members like Legendtech. And um, yes, so everyone is uh, welcome to continue to, uh, discussing with Johan in, this, in the post session um, that we'll do right after I, we hear our last speaker for today. So uh, Bozidar from uh, ANSYS. Yeah, this is going to be a, a bit different from other talks. This is about simulation technology. I'm from ANSYS uh, Lumerical, and we will present uh, some of our work with the Triumph Institute in Canada on modeling uh, silicon single photon avalanche detectors. Uh, hopefully, it will be useful for you if you are doing some modeling and maybe you see something useful here. And also, I will give some correlation with the measurement and some takeaways from, from that, that that may be useful. So this slide gives uh, our complete application areas. And uh, if you click next, uh, we, uh, we, yeah, if you go next, uh, we have a, a pretty good uh, overlap with the SPAD application spaces, either current or the potential ones. So we are working hard on implementing a simulation of workflows and also implementing new features as we, as we need them to, to meet our customer demands. Uh, if you go to the next one, Uh, so this slide gives a, a full set of solutions that we have so, so full set of software. Uh, we have both photonic integrated circuit simulators and photonic multi-physics simulators. And uh, uh, aside, uh, in addition to that, we have interoperability with other software vendors and also high performance computing and cloud features. In this talk, we are going to cover three or use three uh, multi-physics solvers. One is charge. So if you go skip a few slides, uh, it will designate uh, the three solvers that I'm talking about. So one is charge, which is a transport simulator for uh, electronics. Another one is stack, which is the optical multi-layer solver. And the final is edit TV, which is a full 3D electromagnetic solver. So maybe you can skip a few slides now because um, that's, yeah, you can skip the next one as well. And so here, uh, I also want to mention that we do have uh, an example of simulating linear avalanche detectors, if somebody is interested in that, it, it's given in the link in the, at the bottom of the page. But this talk is about Geiger mode mainly. <clears throat> so again, if you can go to the next one. So this is a, a typical geometry of a SPAD, multi-pixel SPAD. Uh, so the things that you want to do here to simulate is illumination transmission through surface layers, and then in silicon absorption, avalanche triggering and secondary emission. If you go to the next slide. So in our charge solar, we can do, we can simulate internal electric fields and thermal electron hole pair generations. From this, you can get some figures of merit like avalanche triggering probability, ATP, and dark count rate. Next slide, please. Uh, with stack and FDTD, we can do transmission, absorption, and secondary emission. And from these, we can get optical efficiency uh, as a final figure of merit. And then if we combine these two, we can get final figures merit, which is photon detection efficiency and crosstalk. And that's in the next slide. So this is also covered. We can go to the next one. So as far as electrical simulation, so this is a custom fabricated silicon spad that we use to colorate without, uh, without simulation. Um, 
maybe if you go to the next, it's a typical uh, SPAD in silicon with the doping profile not shown exactly, but uh, you, you get a, a probably a feeling about the device. So if you go to the next one, so electrical simulation requires a doping profile and we offer parameterized analytic profiles, which users can, can adjust uh, either diffusive or implant, or the users can import profile on a, on a mesh. Uh, the electric field, sorry, if you can stay on the same slide. So electric field simulation is shown the top figure. And from that, we can get the outline triggering probability. And this is um, uh, based on the knowledge of the electric field and the location of the electron hole pair. So either electron or hole can cause outlunch and this probability gives uh, a chance for that to happen depending on position and bias. Uh, if you go to the next one. So in the next slide, um, so additional properties we get from the charge simulation is the thermal generation rate. So the, the main mechanisms here, actually the dark generation, and the one is the thermal, which is SRH with the uh, trap assisted tunneling and the diffusion from outside of the high field region. And the other one is band to band tunneling. And combining all these previous calculations, so ATP and dark generation, we can calculate the, the dark count rate. And as you see on the right-hand side figure, we have a good match to, to the measurement. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. Uh, so some of the takeaways from these simulations is that there are there is a minimum set of process-dependent fitting parameters that uh, that uh, the, that has to be have to be fit to get a good match with the measurement. And the table above uh, the figure it shows that set of uh, fitting parameters that we used in our simulation. Uh, another uh, takeaway is that the SRH is usually, in a good design, SRH is going to be dominant at high temperature, while bentomen tunneling is going to be dominant at lower temperature. And the final takeaway is that when you're doing, uh, doing measurements, uh, it is preferable to do time-based pulse measurements and an end of post-processing analysis, because uh, it allows uh, to filter out after pulsing and crosstalk, and then it can be correlated to the measurement very well. Uh, so this is preferable to the simple frequency counter because it cannot distinguish the, the type of, of pulse. Uh, yes, please go to the next one. Uh, so the next one is the optical simulation. Uh, here we focus on the secondary emission in a single SPAD. Um, and the secondary emission, so it's caused by an avalanche and it can, it's uh, the main cause of uh, external or internal crosstalk. Where external crosstalk is when you have uh, two SPAD arrays next to each other, which can be a, they can affect each other, and the eternal one is happening between, within each within one of the SPAD arrays. Um, please, next slide. So uh, the setup of this simulation is to place dipoles in the high field region, and then define the complex index of each refractive index. Next slide, please. And then uh, you will as a goal, calculate the near and far field distribution as a, as a function of angle and frequency. And obviously, if you go to the next slide, uh, the measuring equipment, the microscope has a finite numerical aperture, so you have to take that into account as well. And we show some results for a measurement of uh, FBK VUV HD3 device on the next slide. So you can see the uh, a good ma a match uh, of the emission uh, from measured emission to the simulated emission, and some of the takeaways here are that optical simulation can give, give give a very good accuracy in simulating interference and how it affects transmission and absorption. Uh, one one thing to uh, to note is that dipole power may need to be uh, correlated to the average measured emission power to get a better match of the magnitude of the simulated result. And uh, the final slide will show some of our, oh, sorry, yeah. So uh, also, uh, if you want to see a simulation of external source, so this is internal dipole source, but for ex external source simulation, we have a few examples covering detectors and, and image sensors. So I invite you to take a look at these two um, links here. And in the last slide, I'm going to show the uh, near-term vision that we have. So the near-term vision is stimulating crosstalk in SPAD arrays. And we are working on this in collaboration with uh, our partners at Triumph in Canada. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, the first step in this simulation is illumination and absorption. So this is done by FDTD. The, the next step, so this what this is going to cause, and it's shown in the next slide, 
is uh, primary avalanche. So the primary avalanche, and if you go to the next uh, slide, the primary avalanche can be calculated with charge. So through avalanche triggering probability and, and absorption combining those two quantities. Now this primary avalanche is going to cause uh, secondary emission. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see this uh, secondary emission, which uh, basically causes photons to propagate randomly in space. Some of them can reach the neighboring spads and then they can trigger neighboring spads. And that's shown in the next slide. Yes, and so this is a spurious detection. And uh, uh, so this again can be simulated with, uh, uh, with charge, with all triggering probability, but now using as the source or as the absorption secondary emission instead of primary emission. So this is now goal and we are working on this at the moment. Actually Triumph is developing a workflow with the tools that I mentioned to develop a full workflow for the devices that they are measuring and characterizing at their lab. Uh, so this is all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And sorry, it was over time. Thank you, Bozidar. Bozidar, it's okay. Sometimes it's happening. Uh, those things happen so that you cannot be always on time. Uh, and we have one question with you, for you. I would like to address this question before we close. And this one comes from uh, CSM, Frederic Zanella. Frederic, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yes. Thank you, Banos. So... Uh, yes, at, in your introductory slides, you, we could see a white array with curved structure on top of the SPAD array. Uh, was it a microlens array? And if so, is it also considered by your simulator? Yes, yeah, so actually that, that image is just used for illustrating purposes. We have an example for a CMOS image sensor, which is basically very similar as far as simulation workflow is considered. Uh, and that, yes, that kind of, that example has some um, micro lens on top on the surface. And I can point you to the example on our, in our application gallery, if you want to see how it looks. Yes, please. Yes, just email me after the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, I would, we don't have time for more questions. I would like to close slowly uh, this meeting and uh, with that, I would like to share a slide about what we discussed today. So today we discussed about signal photon sources and signal photon detectors. We spoke about their qualities uh, when it comes to signal photon sources, about high purity, high indistinguishability. We need that there's deterministic source, ease of use with high coupling efficiencies, of course, and signal photon detectors that have high quantum efficiency, high time resolution, uh, that they can have continuous operation, uh, uh, to lead, of course, again, to ease of use uh, products. The application that we can find for those uh, products are in telecommunication, quantum application, of course, discrete or uh, uh, continuous variable of QKD, uh, quantum distribution, quantum computing, and further quantum, quantum technology advancements. Uh, we discuss about the uh, potential multiphoton experience, how, uh, um, um, how they can, um, advanced neuroscience when it comes to signal photon detectors, and of course, applications scanning microscopy and high-speed imaging. And what do we need and what are the next challenges? Entanglement source, of course, uh, for uh, uh, innovative quantum QKD protocols, uh, better coupling solutions. We saw some examples today here. Uh, further miniaturization of the full system, and everybody's interesting to see those systems on space. Um, <clears throat> so we need space qualified products. Uh, uh, solutions for multiplexing of photons and plank uh, play uh, devices. And with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank our speakers uh, for those very interesting talks today. But I also uh, would like to thank all the participants for actively participating. And we will have a very, we had a very interesting discussion. Uh, do not forget that if you have any kind of request or you would like to get connected with any of the speakers today or, or with other participants, feel free to send me back an email to me or to my colleague Ivan. So have a nice evening uh, and uh, hi also to the ones on YouTube. Bye.